Hey folks, my name is Brian Stavely. I'm the author of The Emperor's Blades and um, the forthcoming The Empire's Ruin. And I'm back to answer some more questions. We got a good list here. Some are very specific, some are very general. So let's just dive into it. We have a question about Kestrim emotion and Kestrim showing emotion in situations where that seems totally implausible, which is all the situations because Kestrim are supposed to have emotions. After all, they came into being before the existence of the young gods, who are the gods of emotion, so they're not rotten or infected with emotion. But readers, I'm sort of conflating two questions here, but readers have pointed out rightly, I think, that there are times where they act in ways that seem motivated by human emotion. So what what's the deal with that? Um, and the answer is, I think, twofold. Uh, there are different answers to this question. One is that actions that they take that seem motivated by emotion, from our point of view, aren't. Um, you know, there's an instance where one of the Kestrian reaches out and touches somebody's face um, that, to our eyes, our sort of anthropomorphizing eyes, looks like a gesture of tenderness or kindness or compassion. But really, the Kestrim are, are just naturally curious beings. They're driven by this intellectual curiosity. And that curiosity uh, finds answers in all the different senses, right? They don't just look at people. They don't just do math problems in their heads. So that Kestrim in that moment is doing just a little miniature science experiment, right? He's just reaching out. He wants to see, okay, what's, you know, kind of what's the texture? What's the sweat that's happening here? What does this feel like? I can see what this human character looks like in the moment before her death, but I want to know with more senses about her. So that is not a moment of tenderness or gentleness. That's a moment of pure curiosity and that Kestrim trying to learn through all the senses that are available to him. But that so that 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 moment um it's not really a spoiler it happens in the prologue of the emperor's blade so that happens you know many 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 thousands of years before the events of the of the books um when you see surviving kestrim showing something that looks like human emotion during the series it's a little bit more complicated because while they were not born under the auspices of the new gods and so they don't have uh, natural emotions They've been alive for thousands of years while the new gods, the gods of emotion, have been in the world. So yes, somebody asked, are the Kestrim a little bit rotten? And the answer is, yeah, I think, I think they are. I think emotion is starting to seep into them. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna give any spoilers, but there are um, two specific instances I'm thinking of. One at the end of The Last Mortal Bond, which is the end of the first trilogy, and one uh, in The Empire's Ruin, which is the new book, both where I think readers could say, wait, that is that is human emotion there. Maybe not the full spectrum of it, maybe not the full force of it, um, but there is something that's happening there. It has seeped into them. So yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it's a sort of a complicated answer. What type of shoes do I wear? I got a lot of shoes, a lot of shoes for different uh, circumstances, different occasions. In the summer, I wear Chacos. I find they're superior to Tevas. They don't have plastic buckles and the soles don't delaminate. So if you want a good sport sandal, I recommend the Chaco. If I'm doing trail building, I wear steel-toed Keens so I don't chop my foot off with uh, the trail building tools. Um, in the winter, if I'm doing something fancy, I wear Bluntstones, which kind of gives you a sense of how not fancy I actually am and when I'm trail running I wear Hoka Speed Goats. Uh, the Speed Goat 2 I think is superior to the Speed Goat 4. They have Vibram soles, uh, they're a maximalist shoe so a really thick cushion, a lot of rocker. I'm old and they help protect my knees so if you're an old person, all the young people I know are wearing these minimalist shoes. I'm like no, put some mattresses on my feet, spare my knees, spare my back, I've already lost an inch. Um, so yeah, the Hoka Speed Goats. So those are, those are just some some of my many shoes. So we have a question about the TV show. Legion M's investors and fans know that the books are in development for TV and I can't tell you a lot about it because that's the way that these development deals go. But 
things look good. I have a lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm for this. Can't wait to talk with you more about it in future. Um, will there be a way for Legion M investors or uh, fans to audition for the show? Beats the hell out of me. That's, that's beyond my pay grade. I write the books. Uh, I come up with the stories. All this, all this LA West Coast Hollywood stuff is a massive mystery to me. But maybe. Uh, so I guess the best I can do is say stay tuned on that front. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm feeling very excited, very optimistic, constrained in how much I can talk about. Here's a question about theology, mythology, the pantheon of the gods of Anur. Um, this is one that I'm going to have to limit myself. I could talk about this for a full hour. I will try not to. Um, but the person says, how did you come up with all this stuff? Where did it come from? The, the deep backstory is that I used to teach high school, and one of the courses that I used to teach was world religions. Um, so we'd spend a year touring the world, um, looking at the, the development of religion around the world, the practice of religion around the world, um, reading a lot of uh, religious texts, watching videos of religious practice. So I was, I, I had a, this big mine of exciting, fascinating real world material that I was shameless about drawing on. That said, I didn't just want to recreate one of the religions from our earth. I wanted to I wanted to make my own religion. But one of the things that I wanted to port over into my books, one of the aspects of theology was the uncertainty. Um, in, in some fantasy novels, you see that this isn't a this isn't a fault, but it's just not what I wanted to do. It's very clear to everybody. It's like, okay, there's the god of snakes, and everybody's like, that's the god of snakes, and there's the god of the moon, and everybody's like, that's the god of the moon. And the truth, the metaphysical truth of the gods is the understanding that the people of the world have about the gods. There's no, um, there's no disjunction between people's understanding of the divine and the truth of the divine. That is, I think, not how we experience the divine in, in our world. Now, I'm sure there are people who are devout in many different traditions who disagree with me and say, no, I, I understand the truth and, and, and I'm right. Um, I'm a, I'm a non-religious person, and so I'm fascinated by all the difference um, and the uncertainty, even within a given tradition, whether you're talking about Islam or you're talking about um, Hinduism or just different branches of Hinduism, there's all kinds of disagreement and confusion. Um, and I wanted to have some of that in my world. So if you look in the back of, um, I think any of the books, like The Emperor's Blades has, has a, uh, a pantheon of the gods, but it says, the gods as understood by citizens of the Anurian Empire. Um, so I have my ideas about the truth of the gods, but I even want those ideas to be sort of uncertain and conditional because as you go back into prehistory, um, before the existence of humans, before the ex existence of the Kestrian and the Neverine, knowledge about the gods becomes less and less and less certain. So even some, you know, the, the young gods, they are documented in history in the books. These are the gods of emotion, love and hate and courage and all this stuff. Um, they are a matter of historical record in my books. But the old gods, the blank god, A, Ta, who's the god of chaos, um, nobody really knows much about them. And so the orders that worship those gods, they have ideas, but they also have their schisms and factions, um, their disagreements and uncertainties. And I think that's fun and exciting and a, and, a, and a thing that I play with over the course of the book. So you'll have people who say, like Intara, she's the goddess of light. In the Emperor's Blades, you have a church of Intara who are devoted to her, but you also have the royal family who claims that they are descended from her. And those two groups disagree about who Intara was, who she's backing, uh, what she wants. Um, and, you know, I don't want to spoil anything in the Emperor's Blades, but the disagreement between the royal family and the Church of Intara is fundamental to the books. And in, in some fantasy, you would say, well, one of them has it right, and one of them has it wrong. Intara is pretty removed from this world, so it's never clear who has it right and who has it wrong. Um, there's, you know, one of the characters, Adair, um, later in the books is considered 
a prophet of Intara. She declares herself a prophet of Intara. But in her honest moments, she's like, shit, I don't know. I, I have some ideas. I think maybe I'm getting some guidance from the goddess, but maybe I'm delusional. Um, and so that struggle um, with uncertainty was a thing that I wanted to carry over from the real world into, into this fantasy novel, rather than just saying, these are the gods, everybody knows the gods, everybody agrees about who the gods are and how they work. So I guess that's sort of oblique. It doesn't answer the question of where it came from, but it'll do because it's a, it's a feature of the divine in my books that I spent a lot of time thinking about and enjoyed exploring. So uh, for these last questions, I'm gonna conflate two questions that are about the empire's ruin. People have seen, I think on social media or elsewhere that the empire's ruin was a hard book for me to write. I wrote it, it's long, it was long. It was about 250,000 words at that point, which is a good long book. And um, it was accepted by my publisher. Uh, they said, great, they cut me a check. And then I got a call from my agent one night and she said, this book sucks. You can't publish this. And she was totally right. So we were sort of faced with this conundrum. And I said, all right, okay, send back the check. Uh, let's do it over. And I rewrote it. And one of the questions that was that I'm answering here is, did you really rewrite it or did you just kind of edit it? And no, I really rewrote it. Like I started with a blank, Scrivener document. I write in Scrivener, not Word. Um, start with a blank Scrivener document and just started chapter one and, and started reworking it. Now, it's not a totally different book with different characters in a different subject. There was some stuff that I wanted to explore. I just did a crap job of exploring it the first time around. So some of the themes um, and even a couple of the plot points are there still, but it really bears only a distant, distant resemblance to the first book. There are new POV characters who didn't exist in the first book. Um, there are, yeah, whole, whole massive sections that didn't exist. Um, so it was a big, heavy lift of a redo. And yeah, somebody said, did it grow beyond your initial conception? And the answer is yes. Uh, I initially wanted to write kind of a fun, short quest book. Uh, I always want to write, I always want to write shorter books because they're shorter and they're easier. And like, I mean, not easier. There will be, there'll be authors who will yell at me about this. No, shorter books are not necessarily easier, but there's just fewer words. Writing a hundred thousand word book is, is a third of the words of writing a 300,000 word book. And I was excited to do one of the short ones, but it turns out this did not want to be a short book. So the fun, simple quest that I had, had initially conceived of I thought it might even just be a single POV. Um, the book wanted to be more complicated than that. And the, the, the character that I was just gonna send out to go kick some ass and encounter minor difficulties and then emerge victorious had to be more broken than that in order for the book to take shape. So yeah, it was a haul. And that's why it took so long for this one to come out after um, Skullsworn is that really I wrote, um, I guess, 550,000 words in, in that time, which is like four novels. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited where The Empire's Ruin ended up. And I think it's it's in a good place. It seems like all the people who are reading it now agree it was worth, it was worth uh, scrapping the original and redoing it. But oh my God, it was not a great feeling uh, to, to get that call and to throw away something that I, I thought was finished. But in a way, you know what? In a way, it was a great feeling because I knew in my heart that it wasn't good. So I'm glad that I took the time and got it good. All right, that's the questions for this time around. Thank you everybody for checking in and uh, being interested and curious about the books. This was actually a lot of fun. Gave me a chance to think back on some things that I haven't really pondered in, in quite a while. Some, you know, I'm always just at the cutting edge of where the story is at any given time. And sometimes it's really useful for me to think back on events or developments that, that happened in the Emperor's Blades or the, the first trilogy in Skullsworn. So this was a, this was a fun opportunity. Um, thanks.